I mean, welcome to the show. We have Derek Miner joining me here for Sports and Hip Hop with DJ Mad Max, Live 265, iHeartRadio. Nobody's Perfect, available on all platforms right now. And this is really a groundbreaking album. Congratulations to you on this release. And I know you're really excited to get this album out here. But, man, welcome to the show. How's yeah. everything going? How are you feeling, man? Man, everything is lovely, bro. Like, I can't complain, man. We, we got good music out. Everybody has received it pretty well. Um, man, I think this is the most support I've got at Spotify and Apple in my entire life. So, I mean, that's pretty good for not really putting out any solo music for five years. So, yeah, I heard about that, that you've kind of <laughs> just been in a funk for the past five years and you had to surround yourself with the right people. You had to get yourself into a better mindset. Yeah, man, I had to get in a better mindset. And, uh, you know, I, I I've been doing music since I was. Man, I think I started rapping when I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. DJ Quick, I know your father was around. Yeah. He's a jazz uh -huh. musician. DJ yeah. Quick tapes. So I think I just needed a break, man. Like, you know, owning your own record label, being a father, just dealing with just, I mean, man, I, I honestly, bro, like I, I remember a story, man. I was playing basketball one day and this, uh, this old man, he had seen me play a couple of times. And man, one day I think I dropped 30 on these dudes, bro. And he walked to me and he said, you're playing over your head right now. In other words, I'm playing beyond what my ability should allow. And I feel like where I've gotten now is the same thing. Like from people where I come from and the, the, the hand that I've been dealt, man, I done squeezed a lot out of this mug and I think I just needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> So a, a small break turned into a five year break. I mean, I did music, but it was all compilation stuff and producer stuff and, and all of that. You know what I mean? No, you've been, you've been on your grind, man. I get it. If you needed to take the five year break and it was well worth it. I remember years ago, you were talking on, on an interview saying that why empire was your best album. How do yeah. you look back on you saying that now with the release of, of course, now with Nobody's Perfect? Because I think this is groundbreaking. It speaks on the time and it yeah. it just speaks on what everyone's going through in their own lives. Yeah. It, 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 listening to this album was like therapy. Yeah. Yeah. I think Empire, Empire still has a very special place in my heart because it was like where I was at as far as music is concerned. Um I needed to build a lot of stuff. But I think the difference between Empire and Nobody's Perfect is Empire felt like more of an album for me that I had to prove something. Nobody's Perfect was literally crafted for everyone else. And I think that's what makes it a special album. You know what I mean? No, it, to and me, that's why I feel like it's my best album, you know? Oh, I agree. And 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 hip hop's been it's been a weird year for the genre because it hasn't been charting like it usually has been. There yeah. hasn't been any classic releases. I Nas released a decent album. Dave East yeah. released a decent album. Yeah. But man, I mean, this album really spoke to me when I listened to it. And I know it's difficult because with Christian hip hop, do you feel as though that you guys don't get the love and recognition that you deserve because you take the religious route per se? Because you see what Kanye has done. Right. But I mean, the the heights that you have taken it is just beyond and you're coming from a true place. Do you feel yeah. as though that it, it's hard to get the love from hip hop that doesn't gear towards Christian? Yeah, I mean, I'll put it this way. I think that is not I think when most people sit down and just listen to an album, first off, it's hard to get anybody's attention now. Like that's just in general, like, <laughs> let's, like just to, you have, you swiping all day and it is what it is, right? But with me, I've never really necessarily had the issue as far as getting attention or as far as people saying like, yo, I like this music. But I, the thing that happens, I think, is there's so many artists that are bad and they call themselves Christian rappers. And I'm not even saying bad in the sense of make bad music, but just their music is so irrelevant and it's so like judgmental in the way that it goes and so so niche that it's not that people think that it's bad. They're like, it, it doesn't relate to me, right? But I've always made music that's like, I wanted to relate to everyone. So whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, I wanted to relate. So. I think that that's the big issue is most people when they hear the term 
Christian rap or if they heard Muslim rap. Like if I heard someone say I'm a Muslim rapper, I wouldn't necessarily think that they would have anything there for me. Not necessarily because I, I don't think Muslims are great people and they I don't think they have great art and great raps. I'm just like, I don't know if we have culturally the same thing that we're thinking about. But that's the beauty of hip hop. When we just let the art speak for itself, Muslim rapper, black rapper, white rapper, Christian rapper, tall rapper, like when you, <laughs> short rapper, you know what I'm saying? Female rapper, like the beauty of art is, is hip hop is it gives everyone a voice to be able to intersect. And when artists are, are aware of that, they can make music that transcends whatever the subgenre is, you know what I mean? No, and, and you definitely have done that. And I really enjoyed watching the visual documentary that you released with the breakdown, how you incorporated all the great speaking on each topic that transcended into each song. You had Tupac, Nipsey Hussle, Chadwick yeah. Boseman, DMX. It was really powerful in how you incorporated those icons into your documentary, into your story. It made yeah. it a, way more relatable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was intentional for two reasons. One, like you said, way more relatable. Like if people see Tupac, they're like, okay, let me pay attention to that, right? But on the flip side, I think too, in today's culture, when we think about hip hop, we only think the negative. Yeah. Like you got G Herbo in there and people would say, oh, G Herbo is a drill rapper. He, you know what I'm saying? Chicago drill rapper. It's like, yeah, but he's talking about mental health in this interview, right? He was talking about PTSD. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, it, it, it's the ability to allow us to humanize people. Like when you think Gucci, man, you don't necessarily think a uh, positive husband, right? But you know, <laughs> you don't always, we don't always think that, you know what I'm no. saying? But the fact is like, this man is like, yo, the, the, the thing that has grown me the most is my wife. Man, I saw that clip. I was like, I gotta put that in there, man. Because like these guys are married. The, the, these guys are out here really just living their life and trying to be better people, right? You know? Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about the marriage topic in this video and just relating it to your album was that it's all more about giving more of yourself because then your partner will give all their themselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what's worked for me. You know, I don't know how everybody else's situation has worked out, but I feel like marriage is built on trust and you can't trust someone when you're withholding things from them. So I have to trust that if I give my wife all of me, that she's going to give me all of her and and all means the good and the bad. Right. And that she'll uh, look over the bad and 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 uh, be thankful for the good and vice versa that I'll do the same for her. Right. No, you're exactly right. And, and you know, you, you really are a testament in this time, because even when you look at relationships, you see what happened with Steve Harvey. You see all yeah. these things going on yeah. and just we see the, the toxic culture that's going on with men and women in relationships now and yeah. the, the, the all the, the tinder culture that we live in now it's Ooh, it's reckless. swipe left swipe yeah. left or swipe right i don't even know I'll it's be reckless honest, yeah it's, it's it's wild man it's wild bro we live in a world where relationships are so shallow and we do our best to try to make them more than what they are you know make them more than shallow but we're so shallow with one another man and and, and that's why i love that song "Wait" on the album is because it's it's about a deep, in a, a deep love that I mean, me and my wife been married for fifteen years, bro. Like it, to the wheels fall off, bro. This Congrats, song, yeah. This, this song, you know what I mean. Yeah. And, and you have a real one right there, and you know that's all you need. It, it, just even more with this album, man, because just learning about it and all all the struggles that you've gone through, and even when you got to that mindset where okay, I'm making money now you still felt as though that you were in poverty. It was yeah. all a mindset. Success is a mindset. Yeah. And it clicked for you. I think I, I heard about this Chick-fil-A. You were kind yeah. of thinking about, man, why am I complaining about the 75 cent markup? Because I want a large meal. Right. <laughs> pay for everyone else's meal in here, in this restaurant right now. So what finally broke you out of that sentiment that, man, I really have achieved so much to the point where, Man, I have to look at what I have because I didn't have a lot before. Man, you know, I, I had gotten so sad and so like overwhelmed that, and I tried everything. Uh, well, I won't say I tried everything. I'm sure there's some things that I didn't try, but I tried, you know, some toxic stuff. I've tried some, some therapeutic stuff. 
um, chemicals, anything you could think. And I realized that none of it was working. So if none of it is working, then that means that there's an issue in me. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm not telling anybody that's on their meds or anybody that's doing what they need to do to not do it. I'm just saying in my situation, my, pro my problem was in the mirror. I needed to look in the mirror and say, why are you not happy? And then after that, it, it began to peel away the layers. So the question was, what's the, what is my relationship with money? Well, why in the world um, would I have six figures in the bank, but afraid to upsize my, my meal at Chick-fil-A? Was well, because growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. Right. We had it, but we was in stressful situations like my stepfather was addicted to drugs. So, it, it, you know, we come home and yo, bro would have sold the couch for crack. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, he sold vehicles for drugs. So it's like and then it, I would see my mom have to pick the slack up with all of that. Right. So now she's having to work to try to get this stuff out of the pawn shop. You know what I mean? Or, or having to figure all this out. And she was stressed out. So for me, I always told myself as a kid, when I get older, I'm never going to be in that position. Well, then now you get to the level where it's like, only way I would be in that position is if I just did something stupid, but I still have to work through the trauma of what put me in that position, right? And that's what I feel, figured out is like, okay, now I have to change my relationship with money and how I view value and all of that. When you look at it, see, even deeper terms, do you think that, Money is the number one cause for depression. Ooh, number one cause. I won't say that it's the number one cause. I think that value is the number one cause, not money. See, because money is just a currency, right? But the thing is, it, if we put all of our value in the external and what we have, then I believe that that that's inexhaustible. Like how much money is enough? You know, at one point in time, I was like, man, if I only made, like, if I only had $10,000, I'd be straight. You know what I'm saying? Then you you get to six figures and you like, if I only had a mill, I'd be straight. Then you get there, you want a billy. You know what I mean? Then from there, now we we in the stratosphere. We trying to launch rockets like, you know what I'm saying? Like Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk, right? It, it It's inexhaustible the amount of things that we want as people. So we have to look inside and say, my value is is... It's not determined on things. And for me, to be honest, that's the reason why I, I roll with God for so long as far as like with my faith, because in the Bible, it says that your value is just based on the fact that he made you. It's not based on anything other than that. He's like, yo, I love you regardless of money and all that stuff. It's like, it's because I made you. And I'm like, dang, that's that's crazy. Um, the idea that I just have value because I have value. Like, I don't have to have the best cars, the best clothes. I don't have to have the most streams. I have to be the most successful to have value. I just have it because I have it, you know? Exactly. And yeah. you spoke about it in, in deep terms. You mentioned the money thing before. You thought you were good at 10000 Then you got to get to six figures and more. This speaks about the, the song Pressure because you, you've spoken about it that you felt as though if you got to a certain level, you wouldn't have to face pressure. But as Biggie has said, more money, more problems. Mm -hmm. So what are the pressures that you currently face now relating to the song that you just put out in which, you know, it's gotten difficult even further when you thought it, it wouldn't have? So what are the current pressures that you go through now? Well, when you first start out, um, you know, all your decisions, they only affect you. Right. And then as you get further and further along in your career. Now, if I make a bad mistake, so say I say something on this this uh, podcast, on this show, and people don't like it, and I get canceled. Well, guess what? I'm not the only person that's gonna suffer from that. It's gonna be my, my record, my the, the assistant, it's gonna be the role manager, it's gonna be the drummer, it's gonna be everybody, like everybody that's in my ecosystem, um, they'll be affected by me. And that's, you know, that's a lot of pressure. It's also a lot of pressure just being like, I mean, especially in the world where whatever happens on the internet, it stays on the internet. It's, the internet is Vegas, right? So if I say something crazy, like people are gonna be referencing that 
<laughs> for, the, for the next 20 years. Hey, let, let, man, there's viral clips that I go back to right now. They're like 15 years old. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, this this guy did something 15 years ago, and we still laughing about it today. And there's new people that find it. So there's so much pressure in that. But then also, there's also the pressure to maintain where you're at. Uh, I don't think people think about that enough. Like, you think that it's a lot of pressure to get somewhere, but maintaining it is hard. Dr. Dre said money is easy to make, but hard to keep. And that's the truth. That is true because most of the times, like you said, when you don't come from a lot of money and when you get that money, you blow it right away. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What Kanye said, you know what I'm saying? I ain't going to lie. He would have bought a chain before he bought a house. Yeah. You know what I'm <laughs> For real. That's, you know, that's what it is. You know? Yeah. You get it. I ain't going to lie. Would have got the grill and you know what I'm saying? It feel good. But then that advanced money run out and you like oh i gotta do something you know mm -hmm. you, you, you speak about the internet being vegas and I, I love that comparison right there but you you made some statements on your instagram that people i guess didn't agree with around the whole george floyd incident going on and you had some opportunities i heard what were some of these opportunities that you had if you want to speak on them that ended up not happening because you spoke oh, how you felt. Man. It was what was happening at that time. Oh man, it was, uh, man, I had concert after concert start canceling on me. Like I had, yeah, cause I was doing stuff in like some pretty like uh, conservative places. So oh, boy. yeah, so man, I had some concerts cancel on me. I had, um, you know, people, I had people that you thought was tight with you, wasn't tight no more, you know what I'm saying? That held certain opportunities and it's like, oh, okay. I thought this was like, we Christian brothers and we can speak our mind, but no, nah, it's not like that. So I had to learn to really, mm, I had to learn how to eat on my own and how to build my own thing. And you know, it is what it is, but yeah, but the biggest the biggest opportunity was some shows, man. That was really painful. Like some people were, they didn't really say, like, yo, this is because of the George Floyd stuff. But it was they just candy coated like, it and gave another excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and and you know, this is around the pandemic, so it's real easy to to that. But then you look and you see, like, oh, somebody else is there. You know, and, uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, I, I get it, I get it, I get it, you know. I mean, this touches on, I think, I don't know if you saw what the Pope tweeted today, and I'm not a religious holy roller. I just came across it on, on my Twitter, yeah. him speaking about faith being disguised as ideology. Mm. And that kind of goes hand in hand a little bit, I think, which you have faced here in the past with making statements because a lot of times when you do think of religious and just anything on the religious side of things, unfortunately, conservatives use it to their advantage and twist it in their own way. Would you kind of, you kind of understand like what the Pope was saying there a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I don't think, I don't even think it's just conservatives. Like I remember, I think Malcolm X said to, to the white liberal would be the one that would, would, uh, would be there with you until they they're not, you know. So, and I'm not saying you know white or black, whatever, but it's liberal and conservative that use faith to their advantage to get their point across. I think conservatives are just a lot more brazen with it. Mm. It's like they just like, <laughs> yes, yeah. this is how it is, and da 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 da, and I'm right. I feel like liberals at times have a little bit more finesse in their approach, but man. You know, if there's some there's some liberal people that will cancel you quicker than the uh, the conservatives if they don't like what you're saying. So I don't I don't even think it's a liberal or conservative thing. I think with religion, since it's so deeply personal that we can believe that what we actually believe and what's personally impacted us should impact everyone the exact same way, regardless of where they came from, their age, color like the lens that I look through, the worldview that I look through, everyone should look through the same exact worldview. And I don't think that that's how to effectively 
look at religion um, because, you know, a person, a, a white man that was born in the 1920s from Ireland is going to have a totally different experience than a black guy from Los Angeles in 1990. You know what I mean? And I'm going to have a totally different experience from an Asian guy in 2030 that lives in, in, in Ghana. You know what I'm saying? Like his worldview is going to be totally different than mine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it, there's no, like, we have to, we have to say, okay, like, how do we look at the world and, and look at the scriptures or look at Bible or religion in a way that where it's like, what is the truth among all people? That's why I'm always trying to find like, what's the truth among all people? Like, don't steal. That's the truth among all people, right? Yeah. Everybody's if you steal something, everybody's gonna be like, bro, you bugging, right? Yeah. Let's we shouldn't murder people. Life is valuable. Like, that's the truth among all people. Like, so for me, I'm like, well, we can start there and then we can get into the other nuances of things, you know. There's no hate like the love you give. Mm dive deeper into this because I feel as though when you're great, this relates to a Dave East quote, they hated Jesus, they hated Malcolm, they hated Martin. Mm -hmm. When you give love, you get, it, they, it's probably portrayed as hate. And then you get that hate back. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you were going for when you were saying that on this album? Yeah. So the, the way that phrase came about, um, so this was actually... <laughs> during the George Floyd riots and actually afterwards and Derek Chauvin was on trial and he, uh, they convict him. And I tweeted out, don't drop the soap, ho. You know what I'm saying? And when I said that I was mad, bro. Like I ain't gonna lie. I was hot, but it's I savage. Was, it's deserved though. I don't it it's was, deserve. It was savage though, bro. Because one, this man is going to prison, right? There's no victory there that he's going to prison. It's just that there's a level of justice, right? Yeah. And I think after seeing Trayvon and Mike Brown and then like my grandfather, like I saw him as a 12 year old get getting beat, beat by up. five police officers. Like, yeah, yeah, by getting beat up by police. So I'm like, dang, we finally, I finally saw some justice. And I think I gloried in that. I gloried in that and I shouldn't have. Um, but while this was happening, there was articles people were writing about me. They were saying that I was, you know, advocating for this man to get raped and all types of things like crazy stuff, bro. Like that's I'm like, crazy. no way in the world. That's what I, that that's what that mean. I don't know how you got that from there. You know, people was like, yo, just in my DMs, death threats, all kind of crazy stuff. And these is Christians. Like you go to their bio and it's like, a Bible scripture, it'll be like husband, uh, pat, husband, deacon, Bible scripture. And you like Luke 114. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, bro, how in the world are you saying these crazy things to me? You know what I'm saying? With, with that level of, of vitriol. Um, and a person, they were just like, there's no hate like Christian love. And I think the point behind that, what he was saying was, like these people really thought they were helping me. They really did. They thought like what they were saying by standing for truth and holding me accountable, et cetera, et cetera, like that that was actually gonna be helpful in that moment. But nobody stopped to think, nobody stopped to think, nobody ever asked like, why? And the truth is I may not have even knew at the time, it took a little bit of unpacking in my heart to say, okay, where is this coming from? And that's when it snapped back to my memory. Oh, it's your grandfather. It's the 12 year old kid watching his grandfather get beat, you know what I'm saying, in front of him. And it's like, oh, so that's where this trauma is coming from. So you got to wrestle with that. You know, but nobody ever asked why. And I remember my mom called me. She was, my mom, my mom is a old school Pentecostal preacher lady, right? Yeah. And I started crying and I told her, you know what? Nobody ever asked why. And we just broke down together. You know what I'm saying? And then we just kind of started uncovering that. Um, but that's kind of what even led me on a healing and led me on a uh led me on a path to even be healed in that area. Like now I feel like I have a lot more control over my emotions with those things as, as awful as they are. Like now I'm not being mastered by my emotions when I see like we just saw 
a racially motivated thing happened in Jacksonville where three people got shot, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like in the past, I will be ready to just go destroy something. Like, bro, when I tell you, like, it was bad. Like, I've never seen Malcolm X, the movie. Mm -hmm. I haven't watched any Martin Luther King movies. I haven't watched any of, like, those old, like, movies where, like, I haven't watched the Harriet Tubman movie. Like, I don't watch, I can't watch those because they're so triggering for me, you know what I'm saying? Um, but now I'm a lot more healed, and I think I'll be able to, consume some of that content you know why do you think because there was some sort of social awakening during the george floyd incident where everyone that when they're posting the blackout pictures everywhere what was it about george floyd's incident where it seems as though white people finally woke up or whatever it was where everyone woke up to yeah police brutality is real yeah. and black people profiled by the police because you had alton sterling philando castile yeah. mcdonald but it, 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 i've seen it for years and years and years and i've always spoken out about it yeah why did it take until george floyd when incidents like that have been going on since the beginning of time i think since it, i think it was so inexcusable like it like you couldn't make an excuse for it and i think it was him kneeling on his neck looking at the camera while this man was screaming for his mama that's what it was it was such a, the video was so heinous I think that that visual, because we know we're all visual people, right? So when you hear about something, you're like, oh, it is what it is, right? But when you see a grown man, I mean, this guy had to be 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and then you see Derek Chauvin, who might have been 5'10", right? With his knee on his neck, looking at the camera, smiling, and this man dying and gasping for air. I think that that was so inexcusable that you couldn't make a excuse, regardless of whether he was a criminal or not. You know what I mean? Like that's what it was with Alton Sterling. Oh, he's been in and out of jail, et cetera, et cetera. But with 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 George, like it was like, yo, no one deserves to be treated in this way. And I think that that's what set it off. I think you're right about that. I want to get back to the album and, and just everything that was said in this documentary because it was powerful and, and just the, the people that you lost because your father was a huge influence, especially because he, he was a jazz musician, just learning about that and just everything else that you've gone through throughout your life. There was a point where you were so low that you just didn't want to be here anymore. So how did you get out of that? Cause that's deep depression. You know, we're talking yeah. suicidal thoughts and you know, yeah. I, yeah. You know, there are all there are times where I feel the same way. Yeah. How did you, get out of that mindset because that's deep depression man deep 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 depression bro um you know there was a moment in time um where i went to this retreat called refuge so refuge is uh it's, it's in montana and wyoming and my partner was like yo you just need to come out here and when I went out there, man, I get out there and there's a bunch of like white guys. And I was just like, oh, I want to my older white guys, bro. Like, you oh, know what boy. I'm saying? I was like, oh man, what am I doing out here? But there was no cell service. All there was was fishing. And bro, I literally sat and looked at a mountain for four days straight. And it was like, and we had this thing where we all got to come to the table and we all got to talk. And I kind of didn't really say nothing. And it wasn't until the last day. And I really just kind of just broke down and I trusted people. And that started a process in me where I told them like where I was at. I literally told them like, you know, how triggering it even was for me to be there with them. So that was one thing. And I think just the fact that there was no cell phone and I had to look at a mountain and just kind of think, where am I? What am I? Who am I? And, ref and, and reflect a little bit. Because I think in time, right times right now, especially America, America tells us that you don't take breaks, right? You, I've heard people say, I sleep when I'm dead, right? No. If you don't sleep, you're gonna die. Like, <laughs> and I think that <laughs> like, if you don't sleep, you're gonna die. And 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 I thought, man, like, 
my life is more valuable than my output, my productivity. I'm not a machine. I'm not a slave. And then it made me realize why in the Bible that having a Sabbath or a day of rest that's set apart, that's not that's not like the other days, why that was so important to God that he made it a commandment. It's because anything you can't say no to, you're a slave to. So if I can't say no to work, I'm a slave to work. If I can't say no to TikTok or social media, I'm a slave to it. And I determined in my heart that I'm like, I'm not going to be a slave to anything but enjoying life. So the first thing I said was, okay, let me find peace. And then the next thing is let me protect it. And that's what I do now, man, is like if it doesn't bring me joy, rest and happiness, I'm trying to get away from it as fast as possible. You know, sometimes we got to do stuff. You know, sometimes we got to do stuff we don't enjoy. That's just what, you know, what I don't enjoy doing taxes, but we got to do it. But, bro, I'm trying to get through it as fast as possible, bro. Like, I'm not going to labor on that for long. And I and also, I, um, I started going through this emotional intelligence uh, course. It actually, ironically, it was my friend sent it to me. It's about trading stocks. And the guy says, in order to trade stocks, the first thing you have to understand is your emotions and emotional intelligence. And, man, I started looking at it, and it was talking about neuroplasticity and how you can train your brain to be negative. And I started being like, yo, I trained my brain to be negative for so many years. And that was a good thing, right? So imagine, you know, let's take the money issue we talked about at first. I was in a tumultuous situation with money. So I trained myself that I have to save. I have to save. I have to protect. I have to protect, right? But the problem is if you don't retrain your brain when you're in a different environment, you'll still carry those old habits into your new environment and new life and that's what i realized it's like the work that i have to do is in the mirror and it's in my heart and that actually helped me get out of out of my depression it was just like focusing on myself and saying what makes me happy anything any person any like philosophy whatever if it doesn't bring me joy like i had to get rid of it for a season not to say i'm gonna get rid of it for forever but just I gotta. I have to be happy for a season, and even music. I had to put down music. I put down. I put down even producing for a little bit. Just like I don't want to do music at all. I'm just gonna literally just sit here and just not do anything. So I had to put everything down, and then I started reintroducing the things that I felt were valuable, um, that did bring me joy, things that I missed, and that's where I'm at now. And I'm happy to hear that you are in a better mind space. I know you were really excited to share this album because you were going on to these performances and trying to just play the concepts for people when you were performing on some of these shows. Yeah. So now how are you looking forward to now with the finished product that you have here and sharing this with, with the world on a live stage? Oh, yeah. So early on, and I've never heard of an artist doing this, but before my album was even done, I toured it. Um, I think we did 25 cities, but we didn't, I didn't do it in a concert form. I did it almost like a Ted talk. So it was like, people are saying, yo, this documentary is so profound. And, and I've never seen anything where artists breaks down each song and there's so much of this personal stuff. Well, that was literally from the tour. Like I went out and I did this and people liked it so much. They were like, every place I stopped, they were like, yo, you have to do this for the people online. I want them to experience the album in the same way that I'm experiencing it. So that's what made me go home and start doing that. But the, so that creates the documentary the, or the visual commentary. Cool. My next step is I'm touring with a band, bro. Like I did a show in Nashville. We had drums, we had guitar, keys, we had trumpet, man. I almost had tuba, but he, he couldn't make it. But Man, I'm trying to tour this thing and make it a musical experience because I think the reason why hip hop is struggling right now is because we've allowed it to become disposable. Like, man, there's I, no meaning in it anymore. It's all for, it's all trendy. You don't have because I always say this all the time. Name a classic hip hop album that's come out in recent years. You can't do it. It's rough. There's man. no more Illmatics. There's no more Ready to Die. There's no more All Eyes on those. That time's over, and that's just why your album stands out to me this year because. Yeah. It's true within you're ahead of your time. Man, ahead of your time right now. Cause it's art. 
I stopped yeah. treating my music like people are treating their music like content. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I'm going to treat content like content and art like art. Mm-hmm. Like my album is an art piece. Um, that's what that is. It's not it's not content. And I think people are over it. Like people are over the trendy stuff. I think we're going into a season. And and the reason why, because think we got inflation, man, groceries is expensive. Gas is expensive. Man, we done lost family members in the past three years to pandemics. We done had racial unrest. Hell, our former president looked like he about to go to jail. Yeah. Bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, bro, we do not have time to just be playing around. I think like we done partied in BS for so long. And that was a I think that was a numbing mechanism to allow us collectively, as we were all locked down and watching the world burn. I think everybody just checked out and was like, man, just give me the stupidest thing I can find. But now we're all kind of snapping back to reality. And if hip hop doesn't snap back to reality, it's going to be in trouble. It just really is. Yeah. Snap back to reality. Here comes rabbity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Facts, bro. Oh, it's unbelievable. But man, this album, like I said, Hallelujah, that drew me right in onto the intro and then just learning about vibrations because, you know, you had to get this, I think, clear international show, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my dog. Yeah. So that was actually his song. He yeah. sent it to me for my critique. And I was like, hey, bro, my album is missing this song. And he thought about it. He let me have it. I'm thankful. I'll forever be thankful. But. I'm letting everybody know when they bring that up that that was actually his song. He was such a real one that he let me have it. But, you know, I feel like it turned out good, though. I, I played this album three times since it released on Friday already. So Respect. there you go, man. The Respect. replay value is there. It, it, it really is a, a beautiful piece of art and just, you know, really making dreams come alive. here. The Freddy reference. I'm, I'm a big horror movie guy, so I appreciate yeah. you throwing the Freddy reference in there. It, well, it, you have a lot of... I'm telling you, the gems that are in here, it, this is album of the year for me, man. I'm telling you. The, Stop playing, yeah, man. Because it's not, like I told you, I, I think Nas released a decent album with Magic 2. I think Dave East, Fortune Favors, The Bold. I think that was, the, mm-hmm. but this just spoke to me. Mm. Right? Because everything's so trendy now. And it, yeah, man, I, I think the Grammy has to come here. It, come it, it on, has dog. To, <laughs> I'm, I'm I, trust me, man. I think all the music, a lot of the music that comes out today is straight garbage. I'm as real as it gets. So I'm going to tell you how I feel, you know, when I, when I listen to your album, man, I, I, I'm being a hundred percent real with you. I'm not BSing you. I think this, this is the, the contender. I, I think I told you you're ahead of your time right now. There's, there's right. no replay right. and it's a movie. You, the, the fact that you were able to put it into a documentary and it touched me. And just like the things that I go through and what everyone's going through, because look what just released, like, was it two weeks ago or a week ago? Have you heard about this guy that released that song? What was it Richmond, North? Oh, Richmond, Richmond. North of Richmond. Yes. Yeah. It, it, so you're starting to see people speak on what people are experiencing in, yeah. in their daily lives come to the forefront here. Yeah. You know, that guy, I, I, I'm not a big country music fan. So I was like, eh, and I was like, I don't really want to listen to this. And is, is he conservative? Eh, I don't want to yeah. listen to that either. Yeah. I gave it a listen just to see, you know, what's all the, the hype about. And I listened to it and there was some real stuff that he was saying in the song, you know, yeah. that you're not getting paid sitting. what you're worth. It's crazy. Yeah. He said the dollar ain't worth shit. I was <laughs> like, Oh yeah. Fact, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's a fact, bro. You like, golly, bro. Like, man, people are exhausted. It, it, but the thing is we've been here before. Like this is this to me, this is the same environment where Marvin Gaye wrote what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like when you think about what's happening and what's going on, like, bro, like that we're in the same place exactly right now. I mean, and I think that if we don't, I think art artists are going to have to start making art again. Like we need your art. We need you to be brave. We need you to be brave enough to not be a slave to the algorithm. We need that, you know? Agreed. And you had a lot of trendsetters in your video, like Tupac, Nipsey Hussle. Yeah. DMX, these guys were doing stuff that no one else has done in the past. And that's that's what you're doing right now. 
man. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. That means a lot. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's big time here. And are you still going on with the campaign ownership is the new black? Cause I know you were doing that years ago. Are you still running with that? Yeah. 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 So um, we just took 10 influencers to DC back in May. And uh, we're literally meeting this week about starting our next trip. So it's been good, man. I, I love that campaign because I get to educate young entrepreneurs on their power that, you know, you can go to the White House. You can go to the Capitol building and advocate for your people at the at the uh, House of Representatives and at the Senate. And your senators want to listen to you because you have a voice. And that's even going to be more important with this election coming up is is artists advocating and saying like nah because who knows what people need more than the artist like the artists are at the ground floor with the people and like who knows what people desire more than the artist man so like we have to use our platform for more than just you know trends and, and more for ourselves but then we got to use it for the people too you you also are ahead of your time in the fact that you dying to live this was years ago so you basically are because you're killing yourself i know people who are working regular jobs and jobs that are hazardous yeah they're dying to live facts man facts we man we go out and work you know 60 60 hours a week no days off you know what i'm saying that's why we've seen so many strikes like when i started understanding like what the when you talk about the rail yards like these guys are not some of these guys weren't getting days off for like two weeks in a row like bro you working two weeks straight yeah like that's crazy man and it's like they can't take a day off because they take a day off they out of here yeah you're fired yeah Yeah, bro like yeah they deserve it they deserve to get a day off why are we striking to give people a day off like they you shouldn't have to strike for that no (laughs) you shouldn't have to strike for that man like i remember remember that man like when you look at these truck drivers, like during the pandemic, they was getting worked to death. And man, it's not enough money. Wor- There's no amount of money worth your life. There's no. no amount of money worth your life. Man, take a downgrade and pay and live if, 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 you, if you can, you know? Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, but man, like no amount of money is worth your life. No, it isn't. Health is wealth. Cause you, you also are an actor you do screenwriting. So what are your thoughts on the actors and writer strike in Hollywood? Because that's another example of just everything that you're speaking on, on your album and, and the Northmen rich, that whole you know, right. that trendy song. So what are your thoughts on the, the actors and writer strike being an actor and screenwriter yourself? Man, kudos. You know, yeah. I think as a, it's a shame that, like, I, I think it was the girl that was in Orange and the, was the new black. She said she was watching it go crazy on uh, Netflix, and she was doing, like, a bartending job. I think it was the Asian girl that's in there. She was like, I'm watching it go crazy. We're doing all these premieres and all of these, like, red carpet events, getting all of this these images of us. And then she's like, but I had to go do, like, a bartending job. I was like, dang. I would never think that that would be happening for somebody on a show with that much impact, but it happens. It happens all the time because these, these unproven actors or actresses get in these shows and you know, they, they have a unproven contract, but by the time the show blows up, there's no renegotiating, you know, and I don't know, man, it's, Sometimes I love America and sometimes I'm like, America, what are we doing? I mean, I always, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like how in the world can you make millions and billions of dollars off of something and people are bartending? You know, there's like we could keep it fair. Even if you make if you make 50 million off of something and there's five actors, you can give them a million a piece and you still won't be hurting. No. <laughs> <laughs> you still won't be hurting, you know? No, no one's getting paid with their worth. That's been exposed right now. And you're right that these these actors, they get these residual checks. It's like for zero dollars, a dollar. It's dollar criminal. Yeah. It's yeah. Ridiculous. So now nah, I'm like, kudos, man. Look, hope because because somebody is getting paid. These these shows are doing phenomenal. Somebody's getting paid. And usually it's only a couple people because and, and that's not even to talk about like the 
the camera people, the, the editors and all of those things, the VFX people, you know, especially because this stuff is so easy to do now. Some of these people aren't getting paid what they're worth. And I think that that's very unfair. So now nah, look, get your money, get your money, actors and writers. Get your money. You, of course, you got to keep it. I get money just like 50 cent. You got to got to live like that. You know what I'm saying? Why were you embarrassed by your scars? This was a big part of the album as well as the documentary. Why were you embarrassed of the scars? Um, I think the main reason I was embarrassed is I felt I needed to project a level of strength. And a scar is a blemish. It's a blemish. It's a it's a sign that something actually hurt you. And I didn't want to project that I was hurting. But the truth is, I did project I was hurting because my action showed it, right? You know, like the don't drop the soap comment. That's a that's a sign that a person's hurting. And and that's the thing that that's the reason I put that Kevin Gates quote in there where he says, a guy going to the gym three, four times a day, man, something ain't right with him. You know what I mean? And he's like, I see these guys that are at the gym and they just cry because they know that I know what they're going through, you know? And I think we all project our pain. It's just whether we choose to talk about it or whether it comes out in the most toxic ways. You know, I had to wrestle with my, my father and his, 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 his drug addiction. And as a kid, I was just so angry because um, he was addicted to drugs. As I got older, I started realizing like he was traumatized and man, they weren't talking about no therapy back then. No, no therapy. It wasn't no like, and even if there was therapy, bro, he couldn't afford it. Like we was on section eight, bro. Like we couldn't afford no therapy. So it's like, man, dealing with emotional health and all those different things, like you're going to project it. It just may be, it just may come out in a very toxic way. And I think that's what it was for me was I was trying my best to, project something that that I wasn't you know have you thought about jumping into the lane of being a therapist because this album is therapy I'm mean, it, it is what it is <laughs> man <laughs> no nah, I think I'm gonna stick to rapping stick to rap. <laughs> you're a rap <laughs> therapist I'm stick to rapping <laughs> but you know what man if people need an ear I give it to them that's that's kind of my thing man you need it people need an ear I give it to them I want to be an encourager I want to be a person that when I see people exhibit toxic traits, rather than judge them for it, that I ask them like, why? I want to be the I want to be the person that asked them why that I you know what I'm saying that I didn't get. I want to be that person for people. So you know, rather than judge them. You you also mentioned on the album putting on for a lot of people, a lot of people's careers, and you got more on the way. Who are some people that are on the way that you can mention? Oh man, well you know. I've had some, uh, I man, I've been blessed to, to help a lot of artists out, like Cannon, no big deal early on in his career. Uh, man, I had this artist named Danielle Apicella. <sighs> man, we did a single called Higher, and that song is crazy. And she has a song called Italy that's coming out, uh, although the video's coming out for it, the song's already out. She's phenomenal, man. She's like a, I don't know, she's a musical. She's crazy with the vocals. Let's put it that way. My uh, another artist I got, Byron Jawan. He's he's crazy with it, man. He's been doing stuff with Kenyon Dixon, and then there's a couple other artists that I've been looking at that um, you know, we've been building. I can't really talk much about it, but yeah, we just been building with some 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 other artists. You know, I'm looking to find out how can I invest in the next generation. That's always going to be my my uh, my my thing. And and you have been man independent for for the long back in college. I think you were in a your own hip hop duo. You had the the bunk bed yeah. as your mic set up, and you were in it. <laughs> independent. Bro, deal. you hey your research crazy, bro. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah, your research is crazy. Yeah, man, I was uh, man, we used to call it the dirty fifth because we was on the fifth floor and it was always dirty. Was so, bro man there? Was he on the fifth? Floor? Right. <laughs> bro, he probably was there, bro. But bro, that that time was wild, bro. Like, and even there, I was like making CDs up, printing them up, and going and selling them out in under the tree or downtown Nashville. You know what I'm saying? Out in front of the um, 
out in front of all the bars. Like I literally would stand in front of bars, people would be drunk waiting in line, and I press like play on the on the speaker, and I just freestyle. And I'm like, yo, buy this CD off of me for whatever. You know what I mean? I had little little tricks. You put it in their hand, and then they they feel obligated to buy it. You know what I mean? Like. I would do all kind of stuff like that. <laughs> it's like Master P with No Limit, and he's a big inspiration for oh, you yeah. in your movement. Oh yeah, P, uh, Puff Daddy, Slim and Baby, Diddy, uh, man, Nip, obviously, you know what I'm saying. I, Nip like the new Master P, man. E40, oh, E40, yeah. people sleep on E40. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, yeah, man. Bay Area is crazy. I love the Bay Area. Um, man, Trick Daddy, Slip and Slide Records, like what they was doing out there. Like I, I've always been, in my mind has always been to be the owner and the artist, like to be the producer and the rapper, like, like Dr. Dre, even though, you know, Dr. Dre is not the best rapper at times, you know, but yay, you know, yay, I love yay. He's the, you know, he's always pushing things forward. He's always pushing things forward. That's what I want to do. No, you're definitely doing that. And how often do you go? Do you ever go back to your university, Middle Tennessee? Because this is where you got your degree. You yeah. ever go back there? Yeah, I've gone back a couple of times. Yeah, I've gone back a couple of times. Matter of fact, I went back last year and spoke to a class. Um, I, oh, I went back this year. Yeah, and, and I think it was April. Oh, wow. Like April or April or March or April. Yeah, man. Like, I love speaking to students. That's matter of fact, that's why I met No Big Deal uh for the first time so i was they asked me to come speak i went and spoke to them and then he came out to the car and he was gave me like a demo tape or something like that and uh that's why our relationship was uh was was grown so all uh, right you, you've been through a lot man and just learned about the independent deal that fell through in college and then losing your your grandparents and your and your godmother that's that's yeah. crazy because that's when you gave your talents to god yeah for sure, man. Yeah, and it was uh, yeah, it was man, dog. There's <laughs> a scripture that um, it was on the uh, Jacob was on his deathbed. And he said, "My path has been hard," and as that really resonated with me because he he was acknowledging that he he had a lot of struggles, and I feel like I have. But you know what, Max, <clears throat> you cannot make an album like nobody's perfect without struggle no that's it, true it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't materialize in that way and i remember asking god a long time ago that i wanted to impact people and i feel like god allowed me to go through the things that i went through so that i can have firsthand experience on what people were dealing with even Jesus, when you think about it in Hebrews, it talks about that we don't have a high priest that doesn't know how we feel. And that was the whole point of him coming to, for those that believe in, in Christianity, that's the whole point for him coming down here and walking like a human was so that he would know what it feels like to lose a friend. He would know what it feels like to, to have someone hurt your feelings, right? He would know what it feels like to have all these things and be able to advocate on our behalf you know, knowing how we actually feel. And I feel like that's what has made this album so powerful is all of the scars and all of the trials and all of those things have created a, a piece of art where if people are hurting, this can be a healing thing because they can look on the other side and I can say, look, I've been through all this stuff and I found some healing and so can you. It, nobody's perfect. You got the title right there. It, it's hard when your deepest wounds come from the church. You know, you, you speaking about you, you've spoken about it before, just that the, there really should be a teaching of financial literacy in these communities, not just here's your rent money. You know, give us the rent money. God will take care of you. Yeah, so is that yeah. kind of what you were taught? Is that are those the wounds? Is that what the, relates to the wounds coming from the church? Man, yeah. I mean, there there was a time when there was stuff like that, you know, looking and watching, you know, people poor as dirt giving their last and then when they needed it the church didn't necessarily turn around and give it to them um man i remember there was a time when i was at a church and this was during uh some racial unrest and 
my fans were defending me publicly against one of the pastors at the church. Like me and him was at it over something about race and police brutality. And, it, and this is the guy that's supposed to be watching for my soul. And my fans were like, yo, that's wrong for you to, you know what I'm saying? And I look back on that and it wasn't, I don't think that he meant anything bad. He only could speak when we talk about worldview from the worldview that he had. He was trying his best to understand that. Um, so I don't really hold him at like some mean, evil spirited person because he also was a, a, a good person that, that spent a lot of time with me. But I will say this, that it hurts when your pastor is the person that you're arguing with publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Beef with a pastor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Over something that is clearly unrighteous. You know, it was clearly unrighteous, but everybody has their blind spots, man. That was just one of his blind spots. But tons of things like that. You know, I remember going to being on the road and traveling, doing like, rapping at churches earlier in my career and man bro it's been some of the most racist things said to me at some of these places and i was like dang man i thought we was i thought we was on the same team like how did we get here you know but people got their journey they got to do what they got to do when did you realize that it was the the healing that you had to pursue because trap redemption empire you've spoken about it yeah. anything that it, it's all come out of things that you have gone through and that you've learned out of seasons. Mm -hmm. So when did you realize that it was your healing that you had to pursue with this album? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't even think it was a realization. It was as I was healed, then I had things to say, like I put my gift up because I didn't have anything to say. Like, bro, I would literally sit at my computer and try to think of anything. Like, when I talk about art form, right? Not talking about making music for, like, you know, ESPN or whatever. That's what I've been doing for the past five years. That stuff is pretty simple. They give you a brief. They say, hey, we need a topic about slam dunking on somebody. And, you know, we write a song about slam dunking on people. And then we get paid and it's on ESPN, et cetera, et cetera. When we're talking about an art form, which is personal and deep, deep from the heart. I didn't have anything of value to say. Like I would look like to my writer's block. Like it was like, I don't know what to say. And as I was healed, the spark came back. There was things for me to say. I had things to, that, that felt real and felt honest to talk about. And that's what, you know, that's what pushed me. That's, that's, I guess, so if there's a realization, it was on the back end of the healing, you know? The title for Nobody's Perfect, because you have so many themes in this album. We've went over, I think we've covered every topic there is on this album. We've right, really gone right. into depth. <laughs> so right. how did you pull Nobody's Perfect out of everything that you've covered on this album? How did that title, it's, it's a simple question, but it's, how did you pull that title out of so many themes? It was me internally forgiving my dad. Mm. That's what it was. It was me internally, you know, he's been dead since 2016, I think. My condolences. Yeah, uh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. But as I was wrestling with the trauma of, like, why I was so angry in certain places, I had to, I had to, um, wrestle with the fact that he wasn't a perfect man but that's okay he gave me what he could and i'm standing on his shoulders today that's hard to do when for so long you have blamed so much on of your development on that person and some of those were valid things that i blamed on him but i was like yo he wasn't perfect because i'm not perfect you know if you wanna if you wanna learn how imperfect a parent is, become a parent. Right? When you're the kid, you like, man, the parents have to be perfect. But when you're a parent, I got two kids, I'm like, dang, this dude was trying to figure all of this out with no real guidance. He only seen his dad two times in his entire life. So he literally gave me all he had and he was freestyling most of it. <laughs> you know, not to mention trying to deal with his own trauma. 
So then if I'm like, yo, if he wasn't perfect and I can forgive him, man, well, how many other people are just struggling with their everyday life? And most of the things we see from them is undealt with trauma or undealt with um, emotional immaturity. Like how much of that stuff around us is actually true? And it just took me on a journey of just, well, I have to first forgive myself for being imperfect, but then the next step is going to be to forgive everyone else as well. Did the song, did you hear DMX's song, Letter to My Son, on his album Exodus? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Because he kind of speaks about it, that he was the best father that he could be, kind of just like in the way, because we know what DMX went through in his life. It was exactly. very traumatic, and you you put it in the clip in your visual breakdown he was just kind of speaking to his son like i'm the best father i could be right he saw that what he went through and I mean, if somebody gets you addicted to crack when you're 14 years old that's going to impede your development as a human being in general but more importantly as a father you know so yeah i mean i could definitely could definitely see that and that i saw a lot when i think dmx was, at one point in time was my I mean, DMX is one of my favorite rappers just in general. And I saw, I remember looking at him and feeling like the same energy that I felt with my dad. Mm. And it's like, that's why I think I've always related to his music so much. So I feel like that's what my dad would make if he was a rapper. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and we love to look at people that have been through these traumatic experiences and enjoy their art. But oftentimes when they act out, we don't think, man, we don't have grace on them. We don't think like, how can we help them? Um, and I think that's a shame. I honestly do. No, it is, man. And it, you really did your thing with this album and you're going to be taking, what's the plan here for the the role? You're, you're going on another tour here. What are the upcoming plans here? Well, the next, yeah, next step is to, to secure a tour. So we're still looking. I'm looking to either open up for somebody or do my own headlining tour. I haven't. Oh, made I think a headliner. Before. I think, you, yeah. yeah, just this I, album because you yeah. have a deep catalog. I, yeah. But this album, man, I think it's it relates to what everyone's going on, even if they don't want to speak on it. Yeah, and that would be the goal. Would be to do a head, uh, excuse me to do a headliner tour, and to have like um, live band and 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 blow that thing out. So it's that, but then, you know, obviously we live in the content era, so creating content and, and merch and all those different things. And bro, I got, I got so many records. Bro, I got another out. I got two more albums that's just sitting waiting to get done. So I got to finish those albums up. It's, it's crazy right now. And they're, and they're all, I feel like they're all art pieces. Um, so yeah, we got a lot of good stuff on the way. Are they going to connect the other two albums that you have? Are they going to connect to Nobody's Perfect or <clears throat> their own subject that matter separate? Nah, they're, they're their own uh, thing. Uh, so, yeah. the One of them I'm really excited about. I'm really, really excited about. We'll have to talk about it. Yeah. I, we'll stay in touch and then I'll be like, hey, it's on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, because I really enjoyed break it down you know I've, I've been listening to you for years especially with empire but i mean this album it, it really hit home and it's like i said I, I think album of the year you're ahead of, ahead of the time because we're in the microwave rap era we've been in it for a while now yeah and you know as far as an art piece yeah this you hit the grand slam it's Thanks, Max. yeah it, it's deep <laughs> I do want to get a little bit before I let you go into your influences because I yeah. know you have the influences back to Pontiac, Michigan with Eminem and D12. Then you got Tennessee. You got your Tennessee roots. Mm -hmm. So how do you think you've kind of combined both sounds into you? So my dad was a jazz fusion player. Mm -hmm. So jazz fusion, that, that genre is really mostly based around just fusing different elements within there. So, I mean, it, you're going to have strings, you're going to have everything. And um, that's what I consider myself as a hip hop fusion artist. So I literally look around at every genre and say, what can I pull from this to uh, make something cool? Um, and yeah, that, so my influences are everything. I mean, I'm some of my biggest influences, obviously, if you listen to any of my music, you know, Kanye, 
yeah. is a huge influence. Eminem, um, Jimi Hendrix, I've heard you're a big fan of his. Jimmy, Curtis Mayfield, uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, Jay Z. Man, I love the Beatles. I love, um, mm, let's see, Dilla. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, Detroit right there. Yeah. Dilla, bro. Yeah. I was just listening to some Dilla today, bro. Like, this dude was, was psychotic. Like, Don't it's, it's, Slum like, Village. Yeah, Don't oh. it's great. Slum Village was nuts, man. Um, I, I love everything, though. I also love, you know, I love 3 6. Three, I grew six. up on Black like, Gangster. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I I, I grew up on uh, Houston rap, Slim Thug, you know what I mean? UK. Mike Jones. Yeah, UGK, A Bar, MJG, you know, all the Memphis stuff, Play a Fly. Um, so, yeah, it, it's all the. I, I love everything. I love all hip hop. I, I love St. Louis hip hop. I love East Coast hip hop. I love, bro, like, there's, there's artists that, like, underground dudes. Like, man, I love Big L. Oh yeah, D I T C. You know what I'm saying? Sirius Jones. Like I thought Sirius Jones was dope. Joe Budden in his heyday, people hated on him. I thought Joe Budden was a crazy mixtape Joe Budden is crazy. Yeah. Like mixtape fabulous is crazy. Crazy. Mixtape Cassidy is crazy. Crazy. You know what I'm saying? So like I've always I think that was the benefit from being in Tennessee because or specifically in Nashville. Because Memphis and, and Nashville are very di different. And it's just that Memphis has a very defined hip hop culture. Nashville's hip hop culture is always morphing and always trying to figure itself out. So in order for me to just enjoy hip hop, I had to grab from Atlanta. I grabbed from Memphis. You know, we had Pistol, we had Quanti Cash. Uh, I start, excuse me, Starlito, obviously. Young Buck, obviously, was the biggest artist out of here. Um, but you know, th they were few and far between. It wasn't like, it was like they were moments where these artists would pop up. But it's like, you know, I, I fell in love with Memphis hip hop and Atlanta hip hop. I fell in love with, you know, the, the Chicago, the fast rapping. So it's like, that's why I grabbed everything from, cause it's just, I just love hip hop. And R&B, you got the Aaliyah t-shirt on and rest in oh, peace yeah. to her. Yeah. You know R&B the baby girl. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was, I was just messing with some, I, specifically for R&B, I, I love Neo Soul. Like I love the swing on it. D'Angelo, yeah, D'Angelo, but you know Dilla was producing Erica Badu's records. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, Jill Scott, um, uh, Music Soul Child, like that whole era of um, of R and B. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed Drew Hill too. I thought Drew Hill was crazy. Cisco, yeah, and Cisco. But Drew Hill though, Drew Hill specifically as a group, yeah, as a group was nuts. Jagged Edge. So man. I, I just love music, bro. Like I listen to Bach, I listen to Mozart, I listen to literally everything. If it's good, I even listen to country. Like if it's good, I'm listening to it. You know what I mean? I am. Country is a tough sale for me, but I, I get it. Be. It can it, it definitely can be. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely can be. But but then when you realize that a lot of country drew its roots from blues, right? So, you know, um, a lot of them cats was, you know, they derivatives of BB King and you know derivatives of, of 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 that. Then it's like, okay, it makes more sense. It's a little bit more twangy, right? Yeah. Uh, your influences they're there. They're spread out, and man, it, it it's been you know a, a one heck of a ride. Just enjoying your work, especially this album. But man. Derek, is there anything else you would love to let your fans know, audience, anything else that you want to mention that we may not have spoke about in this interview? Man, all I got to say is thank you. Like, I appreciate you. Man, I, I don't take it for granted that I've been able to have a career as long as I've been able to have it. Uh, there's a lot of people that's came, oh, excuse me. There's a lot of people that's came and went since I've been here. And the fact that I could take five years off pretty much from giving y'all a piece of art and then come back and then you guys hold me up in the way that you're holding me up, man, I don't take it for granted. And I appreciate every last stream, every piece of merch sold, every concert ticket, every kind word. Like, I appreciate you. So thank you. That's all I got. Absolutely. And, and make sure you go purchase this album, everyone listening out there. If you haven't, 
You got to take my word for it. It's in the contention here for album of the year. I mentioned the other two, but this is a true art piece because I think it really can relate to what you're going on in your life right now. Even if you don't want to speak about it, you could just put your headphones on it. You don't have to admit what you're going through out and into the world and the public, but you could put your headphones on and say, I relate to this. This is what I'm going through. And that's powerful, man. Thank you, bro. Of course. Derek, man, I want to thank you for your time and coming on the show. I know you have a lot going on in your life and you're getting ready with the upcoming albums. You know, I know consistency is your key into releasing music, getting inspired, even when you just drop the keys on the table, getting the the shakers on just from hearing keys. I know how you get all your influences. <laughs> all and, right. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I literally man. just cut something over uh, Kendrick's High Power and uh, – some joy, badass. Uh, I fire. Yeah, so I'm gonna throw some some verses out here pretty soon, and you know what I mean, give some people some 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 hip hop, hip hop. Some boom bap. Some boom bap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm in a boom bap right now, so I'm gonna probably run off about five or six boom bap verses and throw them out there pretty soon. Fire, man. Derek, I want to thank you again, man. I enjoyed speaking with you. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for this album and just all your work and all that you're doing out here. And thank you to Jacob as well for getting us connected and helping to coordinate this for us too. No, and thank you, bro. Thank you for for my tardiness. You know what I'm saying? Oh no, of course. Don't forget, it. please, man. I don't. I know you got a lot going on and bringing your, your kids to football practice. Hopefully, they'll be future Titans one day. Is that your team, Titans? Man, yeah, that's that's we Titans fans. So, and my son, he's like he wants to play for uh, the Tennessee Vols. And he, then he wants to go play for the Titans. So we're going to see what happens. Fire. What position? Son, so he's a lineman. He's a left guard right now. Okay. So, yeah. So that's his that's his thing. And then my other son plays basketball, Nolan. And he wants to play. He wants to go to UT, but he wants to play for the Memphis Grizzlies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what we own right now. They love John Morant and, and they love the Titans. And, yeah, so we Tennessee through and through, through and through. Except for me, except my basketball team though is the Pistons. So you like the Pistons? I'm, I'm the old boys. school bad boys. That's why I grew up. That was my team. I'm sticking with them, even though they've been it's been painful since '04. So, but uh, '04 was the last relevant year for us. You, you you'll have some time here. You keep drafting the number one pick every. Kate Cunningham. You got some yeah. young talent on there. I think eventually get a free agent in there to work out. Yeah, we need some leadership. Like we need, like um, we need someone to develop, develop the players. You need somebody that's an instant bucket. Yeah, that's the main thing. I, I want, we're, we're close. Jade and Ivy, dope. You know what I mean? Uh, we close, we close. But woof, it's painful watching. Yeah. <laughs> we need an Orlando Magic situation. You know, if you, I don't know if you've been paying attention to them, but they're they're looking really good. Yeah, all, I, I'm sure because they've been. I've been noticing the trends there. People have been tweeting about them on Twitter. I, I'm a Knicks fan, so I mean, it's been mm-hmm. years, but I feel as though we're finally getting there with Jalen Brunson now. So it's it's tough. Hey, that was a steal too. Yeah, the Brunson, <laughs> that was crazy. I'm like, what was Dallas thinking, bro? For real, I'm like, dog, this dude was a bucket, you know. But I guess they was just trying to. I don't know. I I don't know what I don't know, but the Knicks. The Knicks are always like, they're not irrelevant. Usually they're like in there with something. There's somebody there that's going to make you be like, okay, we'll see what the Knicks have to offer. But I just feel like it's always some sort of like dysfunction that blows up the Knicks. Maybe it's just the pressure of being in New York. I don't know. You know, it's it's tough, man, but I'm hoping well here for, you know, your teams, the Pistons, and of course the, the Titans. We'll see what happens this year. And yeah, man, thank you again. You, you, you got to come back on, man. We'd love to have you back on once you drop the upcoming work. I love to go through the concepts with you, man, because like I said, man, these are art pieces. Man, anytime, bro. Anytime. Hit me. Of course, man. Derek, thanks again. And they can follow you. Let them know where they can follow you on Instagram, Twitter, you know, all yeah. the platforms you need them to tap in with you. For sure. So um, DerekMiner.com for everything and at the Derek Miner on everything so yeah it's su- i'm super simple Derek minor or the Derek minor there you have it all right Derek, take care enjoy the rest of your night stay safe until the next time man nobody's perfect go get it my dog you already know man yeah hey boy appreciate you man for sure yeah <laughs> appreciate you man
All right, bro. Anytime, man. Do right. the rest of your night, all right? All right, you too. Yeah, peace out.